So one of the things I do with the Institute is uh, you know, write articles, help with social media. And one of the things I've realized is the importance of a good headline. Um, so there might be some people tuning on YouTube now or perhaps in the future um, expecting something a little closer to this. But I, I hate to tell you, it's a little bit of a bait and switch. Um, but I think, I think you're, you'll see the relevance of a little bit of, of history that is often overlooked uh, to some of the conditions in America today. So we're really going to be talking about not the election of 2020, but the election of 1876, <laughs> Tilden or Blood. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating is, is the history of revolution. Right? Obviously, we have ideas very outside of the political norm. And ultimately, it's, it's periods of revolution, where, really, where we see these big ideological shifts. Now, in America, we have a very interesting political legacy here, right? You know, we have you know, the, the longest, you know, second longest constitution uh, you know, in existence today. And yet, we know that in spite of it nominally being the same constitution, there's been revolutions within the form, to use a phrase of Garrett Garrett. Um, now, this quote here, he's, he's referring to the New Deal and obviously FDR's revolution. But we can think back, you know, the Constitution itself, right, being a coup over the Articles of Confederation. Uh, read more of Patrick Newman's book for that. Um, obviously, you know, some conversations about the impact of the Civil War of 1913, um, you know, 1960s and there on about. Um, but I think 1876 is a year that is, is often overlooked, and yet, uh, one of the American writers who I found myself increasingly appreciating is a man named Gore Vidal. And as Gore, Gore Vidal uh, wrote, the year 1876 was probably the low point in our republic's history. And knowing, a, and knowing something about what happened then is, I think, useful to, useful to us now as times are again becoming rather too interesting for comfort. Now, it's a few decades ago, but I think the sentiment there is still true. Because while in theory, right, you had the, the Civil War, in theory, times of war, you can have kind of a, a realignment of norms, if you will. I think 1876, a stolen election, is really what broke any hope that you had kind of restoring some sort of romantic idea of a republic. Now, Vidal himself is very interesting. He has an entire series called Narratives of Empire. And really, it's almost very Rothbardian in the way that he approaches American history with this sort of revisionist look, starting with Burr. Um, which is a very interesting sort of perspective of the American Re Revolution, almost from like the Antichrist of, of hated by both Jefferson and Hamilton. So that, that perspective is very interesting. But he goes throughout identifying what led from the decay of the American Republic to the American Empire. It's also interesting, later in his life, Gore Vidal actually interacted with some figures within our, 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 our orbit. Uh, Bill Kaufman uh, was a very interesting political writer. Um, you can often find this book in the bookstore. Uh, uh, Lou Rockwell, uh, R Ralph Rako, and Murray Rothbard are in the acknowledgments of that, so it's very interesting overlap there. So we're going to set the stage right now, and obviously we have Ulysses S. Grant right here. When I'm talking to normal audiences, I often kind of describe Grant as sort of the bizarro George Washington, right? He's, he's, he's the, the, the conqueror of the South. He is this, the, the most celebrated general of his time, and yet as the president, he was utterly corrupt and perhaps still kind of perceived in history as perhaps the most corrupt president of the era where George Washington was this man beyond you know, such interests. Now, if you, get, you, if you read uh, Patrick Newman's cronyism, you'll see that this depiction is maybe not entirely accurate. But still, historically, we still have this perception right, that even Grant, in spite of all of the uh, romanticism we have of Lincoln and FDR and other, you know, these other less than great figures from a political standpoint, Grant is still kind of held within disdain for good reasons. His administration was, was, was plagued with a number of not simple, simply corruption issues, but public corruption issues. Um, you had the, the Black Fr uh, Friday Gold Panic, which involved his son-in-law, um, along with Jay Gold and some other very powerful people, trying to manipulate the American gold market. You had the New York Custom House Ring, which is dealing with petty corruption. Um, you had the Whiskey Ring, which uh, uh, Grant himself threatened to testify about. These all led to increasingly personal figures within his orbit, so he didn't have a lot of distance. Uh, corruption was so bad under Grant that in, 19, uh, that in 1872, a group of called liberal Republicans ran a candidate named Horace, uh, Gre uh, Greeley, Gr Horace Greenley, um, which created this, one of my favorite political phrases saying that uh, you can vote to burn down schoolhouses, desecrate churches, and violate women, or you can vote for H Horace Greeley, which means the same thing anyway. Um, because again, at this time, politics was in a way that 
you know, maybe we're getting closer to now, but you still had the, the go-to campaign rhetoric was waving the bloody shirt of the Civil War. You know, you had a South still occupied by federal troops. The connection between military and political power had never been more explicit than the conquering general sitting in the White House with a political party, a corrupt political party worked around him. Um, you also had at this time the explosion of the railroad industry, the railroad industry being extremely corrupt. Um, here, here's a Ryan McMakin quote on some of this sort of stuff. Um, but you think about this industry in particular, right? It needs a tremendous amount of land, which itself leads itself to uh, uh, political favors, right? Political uh, uh, trades for that land. It required a tremendous amount of debt for investment. Um, this is uh, Senator Blaine of Maine. Um, who was one of the rising charismatic Republican figures who himself was brought down by a very public corruption scandal um, involving railroad debt um, and financial speculation. Um, there's actually this entire scene where he actually, there's, there's letters that he ends up uh, are incriminating and so he actually like, rips them away from his hand and runs away and then testifies to Congress that, oh, don't you worry, you can trust me. There's nothing bad in those letters that I just stole from the guy involved. Um, but again, these were sort of, of of characters, again, these sort of explicit outright corruption going on at this time. Um, you also had a very interesting economic environment, um, which is leading us to 1876. You have the panic of 1873. Origi for, for a while, this was itself referred to as the Great Depression until the 1930s came in. Um, for some good economic analysis from that, uh, Patrick Newman once again pops up. Um, there's a QJAE article. And then, of course, at this time, you also have Reconstruction. Again, so you had federal troops occupying southern states. Um, you had you know, uh, scalawags and carpetbaggers. Scalawags were sort of uh, kind of viewed within uh, southern circles as sort of the turncoats, right? You know, th these were Republican southerners uh, willing to work with Democrats, often, again, with tremendous amount of corruption, right? So you had these governments imposed upon people that were not, you know, their motivation was Republican politics. It, it was national interest. It was, it was keeping down uh, the rival Democratic Party. Um, and so again, the, the well-being of the people took a shot even by our, our own standards. Uh, this is a book by Roy Morris uh, for the century on this topic, where he says, from the start, congressional reconstruction was as much about hardcore partisan politics as it was racial equality. The widespread disenfranchisement of former Confederates had the practical effect of driving the Democratic Party underground. And again, this narrative is often overlooked. You know, right now, we're still kind of sold the idea that uh, removal of Reconstruction was this great betrayal of the American ideal, right? They still had this very romantic idea that, oh, if, if only federal troops you know, were maintained in the South and we would have peace and harmony throughout, it was a lack of political will um, that really undermined this. The problem is, is that there was fraying at the edges. Again, you had bad governments that the people were not respecting, and this led to increasingly combustible political moments. This was the Louisiana contested election of 1872, which dealt with a, a gubernatorial campaign between Democrat John McKinney uh, and Republican uh, William Pitt Kellogg. Uh, you had violence in the streets. Uh, the Democrat actually held office for a few months um, until federal troops came in to reinforce Kellogg, right? But you had the entire breakdown of the Amer American political system because you had a structure designed to, by this National Republican Party equipped by the American military to keep down genuine representation of, of, again, their rival political party. And again, so we, we see the limits of political will. You had, you had violence in the streets. So this all leads us to the 1876 election. And so the Republican nominee at the time was a very interesting man. It was Rutherford B. Hayes. He himself, like many leading Republicans, uh, was a Civil War veteran. Um, and, and as far as I can tell the record, he, he was a, a, a very good man relative to some of the other uh, interesting characters of that Republican Party. What's also kind of interesting is that his nomination was almost entirely un uh, unplanned. Um, the convention itself was, was held in Ohio, and he was governor of Ohio. And so he eventually wins on the seventh ballot uh, after some more prominent national figures, including Senator Blaine, going through his corruption scandal, including Lincoln's Treasury Secretary, who was being uh, recognized as one of the non-corrupt guys. He's the one prosecuting people in the Grant orbit. Um, you got you know, Robert Conkling. You have, you have some very interesting personalities. All of them kind of kill themselves within the political manipulation of the convention. And up rides Rutherford B. Hayes. 
who, according to historian Henry Adams, was a third-rate non-entity whose only recommendations are that he is obnoxious to no one. So he's just a placeholder that's not corrupt and connected to Grant. Now, in walks the stage, one of my favorites, Honest Sam Tilden. Uh, as, again, Patrick Newman mentioned in his uh, lecture yesterday, um, you know, the Jacksonian tradition of American politics is perhaps the most prominent, powerful, libertarian political force in our nation's history. And Sam Tilden was a direct legacy of this tradition. He was a protege of Martin Van Buren, both of them being New Yorkers. Um, he actually gets a brief mention in cronyism. He was also an extremely successful railroad attorney that made him one of the richest men in the country. Um, he did not fight in the Civil War because he was a pay off the ability to do so. Um, and so because he was a railroad attorney and given the corruption of the railroad in industry, uh, he knew how to go through and prosecute and identify corrupt actors. And doing so, uh, you know, there was no state in the country with a longer la a legacy of corruption that was plaguing the country than New York. Boss Tweed is perhaps the most powerful political boss in New York history politics. Uh, he controlled the judges, he controlled the newspapers, he controlled the politicians up and down the line. Sam Tilden was the man that brought down Boss Tweed. And so here we have stepping into this vacuum, right? We have, we have a country plagued with corruption, exhausted by corruption, a Republican Party that can't keep, you know, can't prom promote non-corrupt figures that they end up with this third-rate non-entity. It upsteps from the Democratic Party, not an a, a, a anti-corruption reformer, who was from the, the North, right? So he wasn't a Confederate, that helps, um, given the, the standards of the time. He was also probably autistic, like if you read some of that sort of stuff, which, you know, again, one of us. <laughs> so then we have his presidential campaign. And he campaigned on the end of Reconstruction. You know, he wanted to remove federal troops from Southern occupation. He uh, ran on civil reform to end the corruption of the Grant administration. But he was very serious, most importantly, on slashing federal expenditures and maintaining the sound currency. Uh, one of my favorite parts of uh, the progressive era is Murray Rothbard's analysis of the third political system. And he talks about this sort of laissez-faire populist tradition, um, the, uh, the Bourbon Democrat tradition. Sam Tilden was probably the most intellectual of, the, of that Bourbon Democratic tradition. And, and, so again, and he knew that he was fighting an uphill battle. Again, the reforms that he wanted will be resisted at every step, but it must be pressed persistently. He was a man who was very committed to making America great again. So then we get to the election of 1876, and this is where things get very, very interesting. Um, one of the bellwether states at the time was New York. Even though Tilden himself was the governor of New York, um, there's still a lot of Republican infighting there. Tilden wins New York big election night. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden things get interesting. There's three southern states that have Republican governors because of federal occupation and the limits on political behavior, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Now, early in the night, the Republicans in these states are sending telegrams to Republican national headquarters saying we've lost. Uh, you start having all, all the newspapers, major newspapers within New York and other major cities are acknowledging Sam Tilden has won. Uh, there's a little bit of confusion uh, with, with Oregon. It's a very sh a short margin. Um, but it seems that election night, everyone goes to bed knowing that Sam Tilden has won. The head of the Republican Party uh, famously brings a bottle of whiskey to his room and wants to be left alone. It's very interesting. Um, this is a headline from the Chicago Tribune. Again, at the time, papers were pretty much explicitly partisan. And so here they are weeping the fact that, uh, you know, the, 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 we are now going to be plagued by Democrat greed and plunder thanks to the victory of Sam Tilden. But then things get curious because there's one newspaper in particular that's not interested in concession. The New York Times comes with, a very, uh, with, a, with a, an infamous headline, election in dispute. So again, <laughs> it's interesting how sometimes history uh, repeats itself at times. Um, and so again, what, what's important to understand here is that the, the New York Times was operating as an explicit wing of the Republican Party. Uh, you had uh, New York Times editors uh, in constant cooperation, again, explicitly with the party. And when the New York Times put out the headlines saying, we don't know what the election results are, Republican operatives started getting the action. Because again, Republicans controlled these southern states. 
and Ulysses S. Grant controlled those Republican, uh, the, the federal military. And so the American military, federal troops, confiscated the ballot boxes of these southern states. Again, they, con- they had the axis of press, political, and military power. Um, the New York Times was essentially writing the playbook to how to keep the Democrat out of office. This is the man, John C. Reed, who was in charge of a, a great deal. He was the managing editor of the New York Times. And he, it, what's interesting is that, so during the night of the election, the, the Democratic Party is trying to, to, to confirm election results. And so they make the great mistake of sending a telegraph to the New York Times asking for confirmation about these southern states. By doing that, they tell John C. Reed that they don't know the exact numbers. And this itself puts into place the opportunity for them to overthrow the election. Now, Reed himself, along with being an editor from the New York Times, he, he was a, a, a prisoner of war in the Civil War, so he had very, very strong feelings against the Democrats in the South. And again, he essentially became the mastermind of the entire response of the Grant administration. Um, again, this, the, the entire campaign was ex- uh, explicitly uh, uh, aggressive from the Times. They, they were accusing Sam Tilden of tax evasion, which only makes him better in my book. Um, you know, they, they, they tried to bring him in on various things. Again, New York Times was the most effective campaign uh, uh, instrument of the Republicans of that year. So this, this itself is a map of uh, kind of the, the contested states. Here we have Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. Uh, Oregon had a very interesting thing. Where it was also a short margin, but the Republican uh, uh, member of the Electoral College, one of them was the Postmaster General, and there was a constitutional rule like you can't be a member of the government and be on the Electoral College. And so there was a, there was a single uh, uh, delegate on there that was, had its own sort of things. But again, the night of the election, T- Sam Tilden had 184 votes. He needed 185 to be president. So there's 20 electoral votes up in the air. And for the Republicans to win, they were going to have to make a perfect sweep. Now, one of the arguments that has continued to be used to kind of justify this, this entire thing is that you did have periods of intimidation that are going on with you know, black voters in the South. Right, you know, the Ku Klux Klan uh, w- w- was in operations at this point. Now, it's very interesting that there's been uh, a lot of analysis done on some of the most profile cases of there, and the stories really don't hold up. Um, but basically, the entire Republican argument is that, okay, sure, we know the number of votes isn't accurate, but we can't trust those numbers because of this intimidation. Uh, the most corrupt state of this is Louisiana. That's, that's, that's largely been a historical constant in America. Um, uh, and, and they're like, I mean, Louisiana state canvassers were like openly putting up the bid, the corruption, like, you know, $250,000 and I'll get you all the votes that you need uh, to decide this race. Uh, but so again, it, this, this, this was a, a crisis as which America had never seen um, really until uh, 2020. So the, the solution is that they create an election commission. This election commission was going to be equal parts uh, Republican and Democrat legislators along the Supreme Court. Um, and then things get very interesting once again. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this was a, an independent uh, Supreme Court justice. Um, so the Democrats, uh, and, and he was going to be the swing vote. So the Democrats have a great idea. Well, we know he wants to be senator, uh, a, a senator. And so they make him a uh, Democrat senator from Missouri. Well, and then he resigns his position on the election commission, so that doesn't really work. He is followed uh, uh, by another Republican um, who writes an opinion in favor of Tilden. But again, there's so much out- outright corruption going on there that he ends up maintaining party loyalty. And so the end result is recognition from this commission giving all 20 disputed votes to Rutherford B. Hayes. Now, again, we are living in a very contentious moment. So you have, you, have, you have Southern veterans of the Civil War ready to go back to war, saying they're, they're going to continue to oppress us. You have uh, Democrats within Congress um, threatening to filibuster the entire operations of government because of, how outright, because of the outright fraud that just went in place. Tilden or blood became a, a, a very popular slogan at the time. And so in order to get through and, and to keep the government going, the Republicans recognized that it wasn't simply enough to have the ruling of the Electoral Commission, but they needed the buy-in of the Democrats itself. Um, and what's interesting as well is that, again, again, in spite of how this came about, um, you know, in 2020, when there was uh, concerns about the debate, there, the, the consideration of an Electoral Commission or treating these sort of concerns seriously was completely off the table. Like, that was, that was the you know, January 5th sort of advocacy from, like, Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz. 
but that was not done away with, or that was not considered. And again, when people do not feel the political process is operating, they engage in non-political action, as we saw January 6th um, and eight, you know, the Louisiana election of 1872. So they, get, they create a new grand bargain. In doing so, uh, uh, the Democrats make a deal. Uh, in order to maintain the peace within the South, they're going to remove federal troops that were getting, or already straining from the limitations of a government de in in entirely dependent upon military force. Um, in doing so, one of the contested elections was going on in South Carolina, um, where you had a Democrat, uh, Wade Hampton, running against the Republican Daniel Chamberlain. Chamberlain recognized that the only way that he was going to be able to maintain that position was federal troops protecting the governorship, much the same way that we saw in Louisiana in 1872. Um, so the removal of federal troops meant that the Democrat was able to take the governorship there. Um, there was also an agreement for economic aid and railroad industry investment, most of which did not come about, but that was within the agreement. Um, it also gave the South the right to set its own uh, uh, you know, racial policies, which ended up uh, manifesting itself in a variety of ways on the line um, that are still criticized today. But what's curious, though, is that there was one more get that the Democrats got. In exchange for the support of the Democratic Party going along with the entire thing, the Democrats were given one political position. Uh, it had to be a Southerner as well, kind of maintain balance. And so they decided on the position of postmaster general. And the reason why is that while this title might not seem all that exciting to you, outside of you know, the, the appearance on that one episode of Seinfeld, the postmaster general position was very important because that's where the spoils were at. You had, a lot of, you had a lot of money attached to that position. And to me, I think this is one of the great tragedies of this moment is that here you had step up to try to restore America's Jefferson, Jeffersonian, Jacksonian ideas, you had a man of incredible talent, incredible courage, incredible integrity, who all he wanted to do was remove corruption from the government. And unfortunately, his own political party decided that they didn't really care about corruption itself. They just wanted it to be their own corruption. And so that, this was a major part of getting the Compromise of 1877 in place. And so when I think about the legacy of Sam Tilden, this is, I think, itself very telling. This is the, the tomb of Sam Tilden. And I, I think there's a couple ways you can kind of interpret this, right? You have Sam Tilden that went to his dying day believing in democracy, believing in these the sort of romantic ideals. Because see, Sam Tilden had the opportunity at various points to buy what he had already won and refused to do so because he thought doing so undermined the entire case for everything that he was doing. And so on one side, you have this very majestic tomb with, I still trust the, I, I, I still trust the people engraved within it. The other way is you can look at that, and you can see the tomb of a forgotten man in increasing decay. That maybe his faith in democracy did not do him well. And again, I, I think that the, these traditions, you know, history, when, we, when we understand the ways the state uses history as, as a weapon, I think one of the best ways that we can take the ideas and the perspectives and, and the experiences that we've had this past week and apply them in the real world is to identify the points of history that we're not told about. Because I, you, know, you, you, get, you get you know, maybe half of a high school lecture making some sort of comment on 1876. And in doing so, great men are forgotten. Great traditions are allowed to die. And that's a mistake. And so, Understanding those periods of time, you know, recognizing the, 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 diff the progress of good ideas throughout history and understanding why they failed politically, perhaps learning from that to take away from later, uh, I, I think is, again, something that I find very encouraging. And I, I think that's, we, we have a long tradition, uh, I think, within people within our orbit of doing just that. So if you're interested in learning more about the Burman Democrats kind of post-Civil War history, um, these are some books that I would recommend. Throughout the century covers this election itself, has some great quotes. Uh, it was written in uh, like 2001, so this was a very popular book among Democrats at the time because like, oh, like, this is just like the Gore, the Gore fiasco. Um, this time, they, they were kind of rewriting like all of the, the 1876 stuff now like focuses on, oh, well, this, is, this was the, the betrayal of uh, American racial progress and things like that it became a lot less popular in 2020. Uh, Gore Vidal's 1876 is also a great time of, a great book to read for this era. 
one of the things I love about Gore Vidal's work in general is that the amount of research he has in it um, is as good as most uh, uh, you know, non-fictional histories, but because it comes from a fr fictional perspective with some of the framing device of these characters, you get a real taste for the times in a way that I don't think you get from traditional histories. And so like the main character here like interacts with Mark Twain at a bar, you know, and, and so you get sort of some, uh, an aspect of perspective of American society um, that again, history books don't uh, do a great deal of. You, he also captures the tr uh, tremendous irony that here we are, the centennial of the, seven, you have the legacy of 1776. Uh, you, you have the World's Fair going on in Philadelphia, and yet here is what America has become just 100 years after. The Transatlantic Persuasion is a great book on this, this sort of Jacksonian uh, liberal political legacy uh, and its, its connections between uh, both the, the English Anglo tradition, right, of Gladstone and the repeal of the Corn Laws and, and really the political consequences of Wealth of Nations, um, regardless of any critiques of Adam Smith himself. I think the political ramifications are very important. Um, and so there's some great articles here about Jefferson, Jackson, Tilden, Grover Cleveland, um, who did take the presidency um, uh, many, years, uh, many years later. Um, I, I forgot to mention, because of this stolen election, the Republicans controlled the Republican Party as a one-party one state for 24 straight years. Again, I, I would argue that that was the point where any ideas of redeeming uh, post-Civil War uh, uh, Jeffersonian liberalism died. Um, some, some great essays there. And again, also the progressive era, as I mentioned earlier, Rothbard's analysis of the third political system is very fascinating and uh, obviously a topic that Patrick Newman is also very interested in. Um, his book, Cronyism, touches, even, again, has a Sam Tilden uh, cameo itself. So that being said, I think that is my time. And uh, that, is, that is how the New York Times stole the presidency. <laughs>